Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on alternating offers bargaining. It's something that I cover in Chapter 9 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. You can check the video description for more information about that. I did say Chapter 9. This is jumping quite a bit ahead in the book. The reason that I'm doing that is because this lecture series is intended to talk about the technical aspects of bargaining, and so I leave those really technical, hard aspects of bargaining toward the end of the book uh, to keep the reader interested in the substantive applications. But we'll get to the substantive applications later on after we take care of the technical stuff in this video lecture series. So let's get to what we're actually talking about in today's lecture, which is alternating offers bargaining. So if you remember before, not the exactly last lecture where we had two offers where the same uh, person, in that case it was Albert, making both of the proposals in both of the offers, but two lectures ago where we had Albert making an initial offer and then Barbara with the ability to reject that initial offer and come up with a counter offer of her own. Well, we're essentially expanding on that now. So rather than having just one offer and one counter offer, why not go a little bit further? Why not have four total offers where we're going to have the parties alternate back and forth? So Albert will make the first offer. If Barbara doesn't like it, she can reject it and make a counter offer. If Albert doesn't like that counter offer, Albert can reject and make a counter offer of his own. And then if Barbara doesn't like that counter counter offer, she can reject it and make a last offer of her own. So we're going to make this a little bit longer here. We're doubling the number of steps. And obviously what we're trying to do ultimately is go even further than that. But one step at a time, what happens when we have four total offers? Well, I'm going to go about solving this without even using a game tree. I'm going to create a table here. This table is going to be very useful. So I've marked it as one, two, three, and four, representing the first round of bargaining, second round, third round, and finally the fourth round of bargaining. And the top row is Albert, bottom row is Barbara. And what we're going to do is we're going to write down the values that they will expect to receive if they reach that last, or if they reach that particular column of bargaining. So we're going to start at the end like we always do, right? In the situations where we had two offers, we all started with the second offer and then worked our way backward. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to start all the way at the end with the fourth offer. What happens in that last stage? Now, Barbara, keep in mind, is making the offer here. She makes the offer in the even periods. So Albert, if he rejects in this particular case, there is no more bargaining afterward. So if he rejects, he receives a payoff of zero, which means we know what happens in these sorts of situations. It's essentially an ultimatum. And that means Barbara is able to extract the entire surplus. So what we would expect is in this fourth period of bargaining, Barbara will receive the entire portion of the pie for herself, and Albert will receive nothing. Now, when we get to that fourth stage, if they were to reject in periods one, two, and three, Barbara, of course, would suffer some sort of consequence for delay, and we would incorporate that with the discount factor. So rather than receiving that full one, she'll receive one times discount to the third power to reflect the fact that we have to discount this not once, not twice, but three times because three periods have passed where bargaining failed. I'm not going to include it here in that fourth stage because if we just think about this as applying the discount after the fact, it will simplify the math a little bit. So just bear with me for a moment if that's a little bit confusing. Once we go back and forth between the offers, you'll see how this actually works out to being uh, nice and neat and require a little bit less notation. So we know what happens in this fourth stage. That's critical. That's the end game of the bargaining situation. And so when they're in that third stage, they're going to have to think about the consequences of getting to the fourth stage if Barbara were to, say, reject the offer and try to make a counter offer. OK, so what does that mean? Well, Albert, if he wants to get Barbara to accept his offer in period three, needs to offer Barbara an amount which is going to be at least as good for her as if she rejects. So we know what happens if she rejects here. She gets a payoff of one, but if we take a discount factor into account here, 
instead of receiving that full value of one for rejecting, between periods three and four, Barbara is going to incur that cost of delay, that discount factor. And so Barbara is willing to accept any offer in the third period, which is an offer of a split of delta and one minus delta. Again, why is that the case? Well, if Barbara rejects a value of delta in the third stage, then she suffers a period of delay, and she gets to take the entire pie in the fourth stage, which is reduced between periods three and four by a value of delta, which means in the period previously, in period three, she's willing to accept delta. Now, obviously, Albert is going to want to offer the minimum amount he needs to to get Barbara to accept. That value is going to be delta. And Albert will take the remainder, which is one minus delta. Notice that's better for him than forcing Barbara to reject and get zero. So in the third stage, if we reach that third stage, Albert will propose a split of one minus delta and delta, with delta going to Barbara, and Albert receiving one minus delta. Great, that's the third stage. Now we can take that information and move back to the second stage. What happens in that second stage? Well, now it's Barbara's offer to be made, and Barbara can anticipate what happens if Albert rejects her offer. Albert, in the next stage, period three, we know what's going to happen there. Albert will make an offer to Barbara, which Barbara will accept, and Albert will receive a payoff of one minus delta. So Albert's value of rejecting in stage two is he gets a period of delay, a discount factor, multiplied by his payoff for stage three, which is one minus delta, which means for Albert to be willing to accept an offer, he has to receive delta times his payoff in period three, one minus delta. So Barbara, to get Albert to accept, needs to offer him at least that amount, and so she's going to offer him, in fact, exactly that amount, because anything extra on top of it would just be a needless concession to him, and Barbara would like to keep that amount for herself. So Barbara takes the remainder in the second stage, which is 1 minus Albert's payoff, which is delta times 1 minus delta. So that's what happens in the second stage. We can again use that information to move one step backward. Now it is, let's see, this is stage one. So this is Albert making an offer to Barbara. Albert knows how much Barbara will receive if she rejects. So does Barbara. Barbara will receive one minus delta times one minus delta in the next stage. But there's going to be another period of delay between stages one and two which means that Barbara is willing to accept an amount at, that is at least as big as delta times, begin bracket, one minus delta, begin parentheses, one minus delta, end parentheses, end bracket. So that's just Barbara's value for the second stage, that's Barbara's payoff in the second stage, times delta to incorporate the time delay between periods one and two. And meanwhile, Albert will receive the rest for himself, right? He doesn't want to make any needless concessions to Barbara. And so Albert will take the amount in the box in the top left there. And although the math is a little bit complicated there, just trust me when I say that that's better than the alternative for him than forcing Barbara to reject his offer and to receive a smaller amount in the second stage. So this actually solves the game for us. We know what happens when there's four stages of bargaining. The outcome is that Albert receives one minus delta plus delta squared minus delta cubed. That's just me working out the multiplication from the box in column one right there. If you work out the multiplication, you get what's on this next slide here. And same thing for Barbara. Barbara receives delta times, or rather delta minus delta squared plus delta cubed. So a couple things to note here. Uh, like always, and we'll see this all the time in these information, complete information bargaining games, the offer that's made in the first period gets accepted, but the consequences of what will happen in stages two, three, four, and so forth affect the type of offer that's actually made and accepted in the first period. And what we see is that by expanding out the number of offers being made, we're seeing an oscillation in the payoff. So Albert gets a payoff of one minus delta plus delta squared minus delta cubed. So we're alternating between pluses and minuses there. And moreover, as we move further and further to the right, the value of each individual term, the absolute value, regardless of whether it's negative or positive, keeps getting smaller and smaller. So one is bigger than delta, delta is bigger than delta squared, and delta squared is bigger than delta cubed. 
So we're seeing some oscillation here over time. And in fact, I'm not going to do this for you. I'm not going to show you how to do this. Uh, you could try this on your own as a good exercise for yourself. But if we were to look at the outcome with five offers, this is adding an additional counter offer for Albert at the end. So Albert will have proposal power in the fifth stage. What would happen there is we would just continue with this pattern down the line. Albert would receive a payoff of what we saw before, but now we would add an additional delta to the fourth power, and that would be subtracted from Barbara's payoff. So again, we're seeing oscillation for both of those players, and Albert is benefiting here. Why is Albert benefiting here? Well, we know that proposal power is a key form of bargaining power. And so by adding an additional stage at the end, Albert has more proposal power toward the end, which forces Barbara to give him, give him more concessions in the stage before, which then gives Albert progressively more concessions as you work your way upward through the previous stages of the game. So Albert here is benefiting because he has additional proposal power at the end of the game. And if we looked at this with six offers, say... Well, now in this sixth stage, Barbara is receiving the final proposal. She's getting a little bit more proposal power than she had in the previous stage. And so continuing with this pattern, what do we see? Well, in Barbara's payoff, we're now adding a little bit more delta to the fifth power and taking a little bit away from Albert's payoff, minus delta to the fifth power. And that's again because bargaining power, or rather proposal power, is a form of bargaining power, and Barbara's share of that proposal power is increasing toward the end of the game. But once more, as we continue out with these payoffs, the delta to higher and higher, uh, higher and higher uh, exponents is getting smaller and smaller, right? Delta is an amount between zero and one. So something like one half, if you keep raising that to another power, it becomes one quarter and then one eighth and then one sixteenth, one thirty second and one sixty fourth and so forth. So it's getting very, very, very small. So eventually these payoffs are going to become increasingly, increasingly irrelevant. But notice something here. Notice that whenever we add a proposal power to the end of the game, whoever is getting that last offer is increasing his or her payoff. So that leads us to our final question, which is going to transition us into the next lecture. Why would an actor want to limit the number of potential offers? If you have the final offer, the final say in the demand at the end of the game, that's going to hurt me. I would be better off if I had an additional demand after you had that second to last demand now. And so both players can realize this. You can see this by looking at the math that we just did on your screen right now. So if you were in one of these situations, you would never want to say, hey, wait, no, that's okay. I'm fine not having one more offer. You would always say, hey, wait, no, you stop. Come back here. I'm going to make you one more offer. So why then would you end up in a situation where bargaining just randomly stops after four stages, five stages, six stages, whatever? Well, that's what we're going to address in the next lecture. We could keep looking at what happens when we have an increasingly large number of finite steps, but as it turns out, it's a little bit quicker to look at an infinite horizon bargaining model, which is known as Rubenstein bargaining, named for an economist, Ariel Rubenstein, who was the first person to figure out the solution to this game. So that's what we're going to look at next time. Hope you enjoyed it this time, and I hope to see you then. Take care.